Welcome to the first episode of Animal World Live, hosted by me, Brent Leo Smith. Today we're going to be talking about the incredible bird, the ground hornbill. Ah, 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 Welcome to the low felt of South Africa. We are in one of the most incredible little towns in the world. It's called a wildlife haven and it is Hootspreet. And I'm sitting in my garden and I've got a very special guest today. His name is Kyle from the APNR Ground Hornpool Project. Hello, hello. So what we want guys is I'm going to give you a chance. Think of your best ground hornbill questions. Send them through to me and I can get them to Kyle. In the meantime, I'm going to get Kyle to explain to you a little bit about the Ground Hornbill Project, how it started, what they do, and how vitally important Ground Hornbills actually are to the ecosystem. Right, so hi everyone. Um, my name is Kyle. I'm a National Geographic Explorer, and I've been running the Ground Hornbill Project here in this little haven of Hootsbred for the past four or five years or so. Um, the project has actually been going for about 20 years now. The original idea was just to try and find out a little bit more about what's happening with these birds. Um, they are very isolated birds and there's very few of them, so there's very little information about their structures, their family structures, how many of them there are, etc, etc. So the original project idea was just to find out what's happening with these birds, where they're moving, how are they cooperating with each other. And for the past 20 years the project has just grown and grown and grown. A whole bunch of different researchers have come through, all answering different questions they have. Um, one of the pr problems with these birds, they're endangered in South Africa, unfortunately. Uh, the reasons being are mainly just habitat destruction from, yeah. as usual, humans. Christine Brackett was asking, are ground hornbills in danger? So, yes they are. Indeed, in South Africa they are endangered. Uh, the rest of their range, which is from about uh, the equator, south of the equator, they occur, but in South Africa endangered, the rest of the area, just, they're just vulnerable. So one of the issues that we have is that uh, they nest in big tree cavities, so big holes in, in these trees, and these holes need to be about four meters off the ground. Unfortunately in this area, because of humans, these trees are few and far between. So one of the early ideas for the project was to actually to install artificial nests for them. This has been going for the past 20 years and has been hugely successful and most of the groups which we might now monitor are using these ground hornbill nests in the area. We're looking at about 28 different groups and 26 of them are using artificial nests. Alongside all the nest installation we're looking at other stuff, we're looking at uh, all sorts of kind of research, we're looking into the, the deeper understanding into their social structures, uh, we're looking into how these birds are being affected by the changing climate. Um, one of the more popular things which we do is which we, we work with another ground hornbill project known as the Mabula Ground Hornbill Project. And what they do is they host a reintroduction program. The way ground hornbills breed is that they will, the whole family will contribute to the raising of one chick. and. They will, the female will lay two eggs. She will lay one egg and then about five days later she'll lay a second egg. The second egg is actually just an insurance egg. So the way they lay is the way they hatch. The first egg will hatch and then the second egg will hatch about five days after that. The second chick is usually considerably smaller than that of the first chick and this chick dies 99% of the time in the wild. Hence the, the term or the expression insurance chick. So what we do at, this, at the APNR Ground Hornbill Project here is we'll monitor their breeding in all of these artificial nests and we'll go and before that second hatch chick dies, we'll actually take it out of the nest, we'll send it off to the Mabula Ground Hornbill Project and what they do is they rear these birds, artificially form groups and then they'll release the birds back into their historic range in South Africa which has declined by about 70%. Well we've got a, a nice question from Sina here for Carl and he'd like to know how slowly or fast do they breed? How long does it take to fledge a, a little a little ground hornbill? How, how much care, especially from the Mabula point, how, how much human care would need? How many years 
per individual, etc., and stuff like for that. For it to be released, for it to be released again, yeah. it is a it is a very slow process. Um, with these birds, they're actually extremely long lived. In the wild, they live to about fifty five years old. So any maturing process and things like that with these birds is actually, I mean, it takes a while. So obviously, with any kind of hand rearing, I wouldn't even put it as hand rearing. Any kind of rearing, you want to minimise. The human impact if you're going to be if you're aiming to release it back into the wild so they will get the birds they'll raise them for the initial stage which is usually about 80 to 90 days um, at that point they're usually fully developed about the size of an adult um, and at which stage they'll actually release those birds those reared birds into a group or semi-captive semi-wild birds so they'll actually put the the juveniles into groups with wild or semi-wild birds and those wild birds will then teach the ground hornbill how to do everything it needs to that's i mean that's perching that's feeding that's foraging that's social uh, cohesion that's everything so it's pretty much minimalizing human impact as much <laughs> sorry we are being we're being attacked <laughs> by a terrorist She's digging out where Eggsy is trying to um, film from. So of course uh, she's always involved. She's our mascot. Um, but sorry about that. Uh, um, there we go. So where is that question here? From Christine Brackett. Uh, Christine would like to know where they can find out more information um, about your project and how they can help and, and, and anything about that. Cool. So our project mainly is, uh, we mainly just have a Facebook page for now. Um, it's the APNR Ground Hornbill Project on the Facebook page. We I'll share it on my social media, guys, um, straight after this. So if you want to find out more, I'll make sure it's on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and etc. where you can find out more um, about the Facebook pages and other social media pages. So that's uh, our Facebook page. Obviously, if you want to know more about the birds, the Mabula Ground Hornbill Project has a very good website where they've got a very, very good description of everything. Uh, if you're interested in more on the research side of things, you can go on to the Fitzpatrick Institute of African Ornithology uh, at the University of Cape Town. Their website is more research-based uh, regarding the ground hornbills, which is what we're doing here. So, as I say, very, very, very awesome stuff. And, um, I mean, how many ground hornbills are there estimated to be within South Africa and then within your study area in total, or even just the Lofeld? So South Africa, there's estimated to be about about 450 groups. So that's roughly, I mean, it's very rough. It's very difficult to say how many birds exactly there are, but it's estimated there's about 1,500 to 2,000 birds left in South Africa. In our study site here, which we just work in a fraction, we work in about 200,000 hectares, we've got about 140 birds. 140 birds and we've We've pretty much, through this long-term process and project of installing artificial nests and things, the artificial nests have been so successful that the group, uh, the numbers have increased from about 40, 50 birds to about 130, 140 birds. So it's been, it's become one of the strongholds for ground hornbill populations in the country now, and it's very, it's been very successful. Isn't that absolutely incredible, guys? That the artificial nests are making such a big difference. Now of course the reason they're struggling to find natural nests is because in the past 150 years most of those big big trees or hardwood trees um, they're like jackalberries, jackalberries, leadwoods, leadwoods, even even some very old big marulas, yes. baobab trees, baobab trees. Like that, yeah. so a lot of those have actually been cut down used for building and whatnot and a lot of what human beings have done in the past we only slowly starting to realize some of the significance mm. to, to species like ground hornbills that are very specific um, nesting and and, and, yes. and requirements like that. We had a good question here from Sean. Um, Sean Benzie would like to know what is the survival rate of a ground hornbill chick in the wild? Mm -hmm. That's a very difficult question. A very good question and a very difficult question. But we predict, well, it's, again, it's very difficult. We think it's about 40%. 40% for a chick to to start hatch and then get to adulthood, which for them to get to adulthood takes about eight years. So it's actually it's lower than you would hope, but in this area we've been we've been very lucky. Okay, and again now, um, of the human-raised hornbills, 
yes. obviously that, that success rate is much higher. So yes. Janet would like to know what is the success rate of a, a human raised hornbill um, to being re-released into the wild and, and becoming a breeding adult. So I'm, obviously I'm not permanently based at the Mabula project so it's difficult for me to answer but I, I, fear, I think it's about 70% that success rate. Uh, obviously with any kind of reintroduction program at the end of the day it's trial and error with these things especially with such social birds living in these groups it's difficult to pair birds up and things like that so you got to you can't just put birds together you got to see whether they bond together and whether they interact well with each other so it's it's higher than the wild birds but the exact number I can't I'm not sure and Becky uh, K would like to know um, do you put any satellite tags on any of the birds or is it all just field monitoring on nest sites and, and, and stuff like that? So we do, it's been done in the past, but one of the big problems we have with ground hornbills is that they are near impossible to catch. Yeah. So to catch a ground hornbill, it's a big mission. They're very, very skeptical of anything. So to get close to them is difficult. And they have been done before in the past with, with juveniles and things. And then the re-released ones. And then the re-released ones, yeah. But not a, not, a lot, not a lot of them. And then Shamsan would like to know, um, is, yes, Shamsan, mostly habitat loss is the reason for their decline. But she would also like to know, like vultures, um, are, any of them, are any of their body parts used for, for muti or um, is that just a byproduct of poison carcasses that were aimed at vultures or other predators? Yeah, so the, the, the poisoning is an issue mainly because of the vulture trade with muti. Um, because the way they kill vultures is that they'll poison something and then the vultures will eat whatever that is that they poison. Ground hornbills being fornivorous can also, the, occasionally they do also feed off carcasses. So they, we would, there are birds that are susceptible to that. For the muti trade, less so. Um, they are believed and known as the thunderbird. So in times of drought, people will sometimes, I'm not sure how, but they catch them and then they actually tie them up and hang them over a riverbed until it, until it rains. And it's actually quite a strong belief in the sense that once it starts raining, they believe that you need to take that bird down, otherwise it's going to flood. Yeah. Here we go, and there's something I did not know yeah. about ground hornbills. Um, and then Christine, um, said Sam I've only been to South Africa three t I've been to South Africa three times I've only seen ground hornbills once well hopefully on your next trip you'll see a lot more uh, especially if you're in the area yes. um, where the ground hornbill project is working and then our Lara Moore um, would like to know where she can find out a bit more specifics about their nests and the, the artificial nests so I think that's probably the Facebook page yes there'll so it's be a Facebook pictures page. And, and you can have a look there on yes. your Facebook page yes we so, have some artificial nests that we've, we've got up there and things like so that so don't worry guys as soon as we're done here I will post on all my social media accounts um, exactly where you can find the Facebook page and what we we'll also do is we'll add it to the description of this video okay let me just have a quick look here now, Kenya Penguin says, my local zoo in MI, assuming that's Minnesota, has ground hornbills as part of a breeding program. Do birds ever get released into the wild from like zoos in other countries that you know of? I mean, I'd, I, no. I don't think so. No. Okay. Simply because of that habituation uh, to people and things like that. Okay. In the, in the pictures, you're showing us a, a very small chick with pink skin. Yes. Um, um, and then a larger chick who's still featherless but has dark skin. Mm. Do the chicks go from pink to dark and or they some yeah. pink, some dark? So that's just that's what, I, what, I, what I mentioned earlier, that's with the, the chicks hatching at different stages. So that's that size difference between uh, a one day old chick and a five day old chick. And you can actually see that it's a, it's a huge difference. And that pigment goes black after about two or three days. Well, Samsung's asked a very interesting question and we don't have an answer for you yet, but is there a live nest cam we can watch? Well, we might have to have a chat and see if oh, that might yeah. be possible would, in the future. Uh, I would absolutely love to have a live nest cam. At the moment, we've got, we've got camera traps which are not live, but they are just constantly up. Um, but that is obviously not live. No, so, but that's that's a great idea, yeah. Shamsung, because especially with artificial nests, because they're going to be put there. Yes. You could we could build you could build a system in without disturbing them, so it could already be there, <laughs> and you just got to hope they come tricky. to that nest. It's tricky because they when you're putting when you're installing these things, you have got to remember these birds are extremely destructive. Extremely, they've actually got 
they've got a what separates them from other hondels is that they've got an extra vertebra in their necks so it creates they've got this ability to peck much harder than other birds and we've lost a few cameras already to to uh, ground hondels lost a pecking few. them um, oh. So, lost my comms. Okay, sorry, I was just talking to VM there. I thought we lost the feed. He just lost my comms. Okay, I've got him but, back. But for now, so we've got camera traps, which on our Facebook page we do. We have been seeing crazy footage, and we've been posting them quite, quite frequently. So we'll keep on that. Okay, there was another great question. I've lost it now, mm -hmm. um, but we can just keep going. Um, now, obviously, we know the Mabula is a separate project. Um, there is a question here since we have the resident ground hornbill expert with us from Fly Forever Free. Um, how do they prevent human imprinting onto the chicks that are hand -read? So there is, it's a very difficult, complex thing to explain, but ideally what, if need be, the, the chicks will be hand fed until about 80 days. But in an ideal situation, what they can do is they, like I said before, they've got these, these captive semi-wild birds that they keep. And these birds often attempt to breed, but because of uh, genetics and things like that, often they don't want them to breed. So what will happen is that when we take chicks from this area and we send it there, often they will just take the chicks from our area and they'll put them straight into a nest of those semi-wild captive birds. So those semi-wild captive birds essentially foster the chicks and then they have no human imprint on them. There you go, that, that is incredible. Yeah. Now, as I said, the only reason that you guys are able to do this is because the project's been going on for so long and every year I'm sure you must learn and, and yeah. find out new things. Uh, maybe could you tell us like one of your your favorite ground hornbill sightings? It can be whatever you'd like. Oh wow. Oh that's a difficult one. We've had so many, especially recently actually, but probably ones two that come to mind and that's just the their morning vocalizations. For anyone who's heard of ground hornbill it's this deep booming call that travels for kilometers through the low felt um, and to see that with a sunrise in the background and just the silhouette of the birds in a dead tree is something else the other one was a recent one is that ground hornbills are one of the few bird species that actually play so they play with each other and they'll mess around and just do very weird things that you don't expect them to do so to see that is quite unusual thing they'll chase each other around they'll bite each other and do very weird things those are definitely two of the ones that popped to mind immediately yeah they, they are awesome i mean also their the sort of um mating ritual the the gift giving and yes. yeah it's a it's an amazing thing if you're ever lucky enough to see it the males are always trying to suck up to the females we all know how that feels <laughs> <laughs> definitely they they so for those of you who don't know what happens is that the males uh, in each of these groups there's an alpha pair, so alpha male and alpha female. And what the male will do is they'll separate themselves from, from the rest of the group. And the male will pick up food, so mostly insects and things. And what he'll wrap that food inside leaves, pretty much. Uh, apple leaves and things like that. And then he'll go and present it to the female, almost as like a gift. So it's a wrapped gift, pretty much. And then if she accept it, accepts it, they'll fly around for a bit, also still separate from the group. And then they'll start the, the mating side of things where the male will just start preening the female, preening, preening, preening. And then he'll get to the back of her neck and he'll slowly become more and more aggressive and he'll push her neck down until she's bent over completely. And then he jumps on, takes his chance. And, and then gets he's out gone. quickly before then he's that, out of there, that, yeah. that beak whips around yeah, at exactly. high speed. Exactly. So they, they definitely are one of the more interesting bird species just in their behaviors, how they nest and, and their social interactions with each other. Um, and if you think about it, they are, they're probably one of the biggest, very social birds. I mean, apart from ostriches and stuff like that, but, and they've had to develop this very complex um, sort of mating, breeding and family structure. And it's also, you find with animals, the longer they live, in my opinion, the more, more complex their, their sort of social hierarchies and, and yeah. things become. If you look at elephants and human they are, beings, they are, the, they are the longest lived cooperatively breeding bird in the world. How's that for a fact? Yeah. The longest lived cooperatively bleeding bird in the world. Yeah. That's amazing. I, I'm, I'm learning so much today. Yeah. <laughs> ah, Kruger Kruger would like to know, do hornbills have territories or do they migrate? They are sedentary with very large territories. So in our area, the territories are about 
80 to 100 square kilometers and there's usually only about five birds in that area so that is a massive massive area for five birds depending on where you go those territory sizes differ uh, depending on the habitat and food availability and things like that that can range from 200 square kilometers to just down to 20 square kilometers so largely dependent on the habitat that they're in well, yeah we got another great question here from shamsan um she says if it takes eight years for them to reach maturity does that mean the pair only mates every seven or eight years so no they can attempt to breed every year um, in the wild on average they only successfully fledge a chick once every nine and a half years so that's every one nine and a half years a, a chick will successfully leave the nest in this area we're sitting at once every three and a half years thanks to these artificial nests and things like that but they can breed and it, it just depends at the end of the day on the group we have groups we have probably the most successful ground humble group in i mean that i know of in this area and they've bred every single year successfully for the past 13 years so it, wow. it's very that much very much dependent on the birds themselves now we're coming we're coming towards the end we're going to take five more questions and then we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up um for this first episode of animal world live um so i saw one here actually i've got a question for myself cool um so of that really successful uh, group that's managed to yes fledge fledge one how often do you see those fledgings again and 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 I, so i'm just wondering if they're how far do they go do they go across the next territory do they go five territories away it's 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 very difficult to say and it's something that we've we're only starting to tap into now with our camera traps and okay. things like that because because there's so few of them and to find them is a huge mission so we usually see them for a few years after that but because there's no tracking devices being put on the birds and things we have no idea where they go there's a uh, if you think about it as well, the birds, when they hatch, they hatch 50-50. So 50% male, 50% female. And each of these groups is only a single female. So it begs the question of well, where do the females go? Sure. And the answer is that we are absolutely, we have no idea. We have no idea where they go. We, there's, there are all female groups which are found, but they are so scarce and so few and far between that it's... It, we've, had, we've had a female bird... Uh, that we have records of uh, that disappeared for 10 years and then just popped up in a group, started breeding. Yeah. 10 years unseen and then just appeared. Yeah. We've got to wonder, are they sort of flying solo yeah. in between and then all? That's incredible. That's a big question, eh? Yeah. See, there's always something new to learn. So, very exciting. Um, there we go. A couple of people, Lady Macbeth, Cenac, um, and uh, are asking, uh, do you ring them? I'm sure the, the birds that are hand reared get rung, but it's very difficult to catch yeah. a wild ground hornbill. Yeah, so what we do is we ring, we ring the nestlings. So just before they're ready to leave the nest, we will then go and we'll put rings on them. But at the moment we're busy with alternative methods. So because the ringing is actually still, it's quite invasive. Yes, no. So what we're busy with at the moment is uh, developing some facial recognition Software? Software, wow. so that you can just take a photo and you can say, okay, it's that. And run it through a program run and it, it tells you it's and female it's X1 from over there. Yeah. Oh, wow, that is amazing. Um, and Christine, um, natural enemies apart from man. Oh. Leopard. <laughs> yeah, there's leopard. that footage of that leopard grabbing a guy on Hornball and Kruger that I've yeah. seen. Yeah. Leopard. Uh, we had a chick mostly in the nest, I would say they get predated. Um, honey badgers, gen genets, pythons, they occasionally will catch a puff adder or a venomous snake and then they'll bring it to the nest but the, it's not dead, dead. Oh, and then okay. it bites the chick. Um, but for the adults, it's the mortalities are actually, once they reach adulthood and they know what's what, they're quite, they have a very good ability to survive. Now, I do not know about this one from Sean, but I will do some more research, see if I can find that footage. Um, Sean is saying, I remember seeing two ground hornbills kill a third one on Safari Live a few years yes, ago. Yes, with Tristan. I think oh, was it, it with Tristan? With I think Tristan. I must have been in Kenya. Yes, yes, indeed. So that would have just been an intruder that's come into the group and been and that hasn't been accepted okay. by the group and they would have just instantly killed it. Yeah. 
very aggressive. Okay. Um, we're going to take fly forever free. You're going to have the last question. Mm -hmm. um, and that is what is the incubation, uh, incubation time from egg laid to the hatch? Okay, it's about 80 days, roughly. I don't know. Going wrong here. 40 days. <laughs> 40 sorry. days. 40 days. 40 days from the egg being laid to it hatching. And then 40 and days then, for fledging. No, and then 80 to 90 days for it to fledge. Okay, there yeah. we go. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, guys, it's been absolutely wonderful. And thank you so much, uh, oh, Carl, for, for coming me. out and to chat about the, the Ground Hornwall project. And it's absolutely amazing work you're doing. And we will definitely be following it. Um, yeah. I see at PaintedDog.tv, we're going to be sharing a lot of their stuff. So keep a look for it. Go like their Facebook page. Go like their Instagram page. Um, every little bit of awareness can help amazing projects like this. A lot of people don't understand how much good science and conservation work is being done um, behind the curtain, so to speak, away from the sort of safaris and, yeah. and, and where people go on nice holidays and whatnot. And all these different projects need your support. And we're going to be working very hard. And we're definitely going to get Kyle back at some point. Yeah. Um, maybe we we'll even go have a look and see if we can follow a little family for a little bit. And, it's um, difficult. It's difficult, <laughs> but we can try. Yeah. Uh, we have Vim. He makes all sorts of strange contraptions. <laughs> um, but it's been really great. So, guys, um, from all of us here, Vim sitting in in the FC and um, Eggsy on camera and of course Kyle and also don't forget uh, go check out all our live cameras we've got Critter Cam we've got the Wild Dog Boma Cam we've got the old Hyena Den Cam but still there's porcupines in there mongoose white-tailed mongoose as well um, and, and of course hopefully we got some new new cameras coming soon but you're gonna have to wait a little bit more for that but for the first episode of Animal World Live with me Brett Leo Smith and our special guest Kyle Thank you very much, and we'll see you next week, Thursday, at 5 p.m. Uh -huh.